Whoops. Here we go. We are one in Christ. We are one in God. We are one in unity. We are one in truth. We are one in faith. We are one eternally. Everyone is welcome here. Everyone is welcome here. We are one in mind. We are one in heart. We are one in unity. We are one in grace. We are one in love. We are one eternally. Everyone is welcome here. Everyone is welcome here. For we are one, one in Christ. In the way, the truth, the life. We're one in Christ. We serve as one to bring God's love to everyone. Everyone is welcome here where we are one. We are one. We are one in Christ. We are one in God. We are one in unity. We are one in truth. We are one in faith. We are one eternally. Everyone is welcome here. Everyone is welcome here. Where we are one, one in Christ. In the way, the truth, the life. We're one in Christ. We serve as one to bring God's love to everyone. For we are one, one in Christ. In the way, the truth, the life, we're one in Christ. We serve as one to bring God's love to everyone. Everyone is welcome here where we are one. We are one. We are one. Hello, Open Door Ministries, and to everyone joining us on Facebook and YouTube, it's good to be together again, even if it's only online. I want to start our new series. Easter has finished, and now we're moving on. And I've been thinking about what is it going to be like when this pandemic is over and we are allowed to go back outside again. We're going to be rebuilding a new normal. And that got me to thinking about books like Ezra and Nehemiah, where they are rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And of course, the book of Haggai, which is the minor prophet as they are rebuilding the temple of the Lord. And I thought there were some very important lessons in Haggai. So I want to share those with you today. So I'm calling this new series, it'll be four weeks long, Haggai Priorities for Rebuilding. There's some background that I want to share with you about Haggai. The book takes place about 520 BCE. This is after the uh, 10 nations, the 10 northern nations of Israel had been captured and carried away by the Assyrians. And then also after the two southern tribes of Judah had been captured and carried away by the Babylonians. So this is approximately 70 years after the Babylonian exile. The Babylonian Empire had fallen and had been conquered by the Medo-Persian Empire. And under Darius, they were allowed to return, the, Ju the people of Judah were allowed to return to Jerusalem and to resettle there. Now some chose to do it and some did not choose to do it. But they began the task of rebuilding. And you can see, you read books about the rebuilding of the wall, and in this book, the rebuilding of the temple. So this takes place in the second year of King Darius. Now in this uh, book of Haggai, 
it relates to the book of Ezra and takes place after the book of Ezra. And in that book of Ezra, we learn that the remnant that came from the empire of Babylon back to Jerusalem included Joshua, who served as the new high priest, Zerubbabel, who was the governor over the land, and they started to rebuild the walls. However, after rebuilding the walls, rather than rebuilding the temple, they set about rebuilding their houses. Now this does make some sense. You need the walls for protection and you need the houses for shelter. There's no problem with that. But as Haggai is going to point out, they got a little carried away with building their houses and lost their priorities. And so the big phrase that you're gonna see that is repeated over and over again in this book is consider your ways. Think about what you're doing. What are you making a priority? Consider your ways. In Haggai chapter 1 verse 1, this is what it says. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. By dating it in the second year of King Darius's reign, it indicates that Israel is still a vassal state. They haven't gained full independence. And so by writing this in this book of prophecy, it reminds us that they once were a mighty kingdom but now they're just a vassal state. And by mentioning the first day of the month, this indicates that it was a new moon and that Jerusalem was probably full of people celebrating because the Israelites and Judah began celebrating lots of new moon feasts. It was probably a feast today. And we can see that in Isaiah 1.14 and Hosea 2.11 where God says, I'm tired of your new moon feast. I'd rather have real worship. Anyway, this is all just to indicate that at this time, the people, while still vassals, had just returned to their old ways. They returned to celebrating their moon festivals. Haggai chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 says this, Thus said the Lord of hosts, These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to live in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruin? Paneled houses indicate a pursuit of wealth rather than having sufficient, a good place to live, and stability. The people of Israel, of Israel the Judi the, from Judah, began to focus once again on acquiring wealth. They became consumed with greed. And by buying these paneled houses and building these paneled houses, they were displaying their wealth. Most likely, as the people returned from captivity, a lot of the old social system had broken down. And so they want to start displaying their wealth to rebuild the class system. And Haggai calls them out on this. Judah had returned to the same behavior that had caused the problems in the first place. Oppression of the poor, corrupt courts, and idolatry. In this case, it's the oppression of the poor. Because any time that you pursue wealth as a means to an end, or as the end itself, any time you pursue wealth, you also pursue greed. And so they took the money that could be helping the less fortunate in Jerusalem and instead built themselves fancy homes. And of course, they had abandoned the worship of the Lord. The temple was left unbuilt. In Haggai chapter 1, verses 5 through 6, it says this, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider how you have fared. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink but never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And you, that, and you that earn wages, earn wages to put them into bags with holes. You can look at this in two different ways. What was 
literally happening in reality? And what is the spiritual lesson that we can learn from this? In reality, the harvest for these people who had returned from Babylon was poor that year. They had apparently had a drought. And so they did not receive the bountiful harvest that they planned. In fact, they had probably planted much, as it says, you have sown much. They probably planted more than they needed just to continue living and were looking for a cash crop to sell to increase their wealth. But people, because of this drought, simply didn't have enough to eat. People didn't have adequate clothing. And there was massive inflation going on. This is why it says those of you who earn wages end up putting it into a bag with holes. It seems as soon as they got their paycheck, it was gone. It's like some people nowadays who are living paycheck to paycheck. As soon as you get your wages, boom, out it goes because of this massive inflation. And so we're already beginning to see an inequality between those who are very rich and those who are very poor. This brings us back to this idea of, hey, you've returned to your old ways. It's the oppression of the poor once again. And rather than being wise and learning from their past mistakes, instead of planting all the time and selling off whatever the excess is, they should have stored that and saved it because you can't build your life on hoping there's always profit every year. Some years there will be hardship and you need to plan for those times. Spiritually, we can look at it like this. Sowing to greed produces no spiritual fruit. Oh, they've sown much, but they've sown to the wrong thing. And so no spiritual fruit is grown. No love, no patience, none of those things. You can, no matter how many material possessions you have, you are never truly satisfied. They're saying you eat and you drink and, and you have these clothes, but nobody's really warm. Because greed is a hungry monster that is never satisfied. And the more you attempt to feed your greed, the hungrier you become. You spend all your money on trying to maintain a lifestyle. Haven't we seen this many a time? Some folks, they may earn a really great wage, but it's gone as soon as they get it. They've maxed out their credit cards. They're living an extravagant lifestyle that they can't afford rather than living within their means and saving for the future. In Haggai chapter 1, verses 7 through 8, this is what it says. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider how you have fared. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. The Lord God calls them back to refocusing their priorities. You need to build the temple because the temple was the center of worship. The temple was the central place for learning about God and experiencing God, and it simply was not there. And it's interesting that he has to tell them to go and bring back wood, because apparently they had enough stone and wood at some point, but most likely they had used the wood to build their paneled houses. They misplaced their priorities, and God is calling them back. Go and get the wood, finish this house. You need to have a spiritual life. So in reality, they need to build the temple so that the people actually have a place to worship because there was no place to worship. And spiritually, we need to learn the lesson that we have to focus on the spiritual aspects of your life and not material things. Stop acquiring more and more. We have homes. We don't need mansions. We have cars, we don't need Lamborghinis. We have food, we don't need five-star restaurants. Oftentimes we overfeed our desires of worldly things for possessions and material things and neglect our spiritual life. In Haggai chapter 1, verse 9, it says this, You have looked for much, and lo, it became little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because my house lies in ruin, while you all hurry off to your own houses. God is saying the consequences of you ignoring your spiritual life and focusing on the material world is that you're failing right now. The very things that brought the judgment upon you in the first place, so that you were carried away by the Assyrians and Babylonians, you're doing again. You didn't learn your lesson. 
In reality, their harvest was less than expected, and what there was was quickly gone. They didn't harvest as much food as they had in previous years, and so it was quickly consumed. You know, we need to plan for the future. It's silly to say to yourself, well, the Lord will always provide for me. The Lord provides years of plenty with the expectation that we save for the future. Just like Joseph in his dream that he interpreted for Pharaoh, that there would be seven years of plenty and that they should save for the future. This is a lesson that we need to learn, not to expect God to produce plenty for us every year. Spiritually, if you are basing your life on, you don't base your life on things you can't control. We can't control the weather. Some years are good years, there's plenty of rain and the crops grow, and other years, there's no rain and the crops don't grow. We have no control of that. And so it's a gamble to base your life on something you can't control like the weather. It's a gamble to base your life on the economy because the economy goes up and the economy goes down and we have no control over it. But yet, if we are prudent, if we take precautions and put money away for the bad times, then we will be able to make it out securely. Your spiritual life can bring spiritual growth and contentment even in difficult times. If you use the wisdom that God has given you to prepare for the hard times, even though you may not be able to enjoy as many material possessions, you will still be content. You will be like Paul who has said, I have learned to rejoice in abundance and to be content even when there's little. We need to learn this idea of contentment and not to always base our happiness and our entire lives on having extravagance. In Haggai chapter 1, verses 10 through 11, it says this, Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the soil produces, on human beings and animals, on all their labor. In reality, for the people who were living in Palestine at that time, the three main crops were indeed grain, wine, and oil. And all of these did not produce what was expected. There was less than what they had expected because of the drought. All their hard work of the people and the animals was simply not producing. You know you can chase after wealth all you want, but there's no guarantee that you're going to get it, no matter how hard you work for it. Spiritually, we can look at it this way. All three of these items, grain, wine, and oil, are used as offerings in the temple. And hoarding them for yourself for profit just isn't working. We need to not only take care of our material needs, but we should not hoard material things, but give freely and generously to the temple, to the house of God. We need to sow to spiritual things so that we can be spiritually fed as well. We need to set God as a priority. Haggai chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of the prophet Haggai, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. And we can see this both in reality and spiritually. The Lord is with us. The Lord never abandons us. The Lord is always with us and he is on our side. He repeatedly calls us and warns us, don't focus on the wrong things. Don't focus on the material world. Instead, focus on your spiritual life because if you use the wisdom and the common sense that I have given you, if you follow biblical principles, you will be blessed and your life will be better for it. So we need to ask ourselves this, are we making ourselves available to him? He is always with us, but we're not always with him. Like sheep, we go astray. 
and we tend to move away from him and focus on other things. We need to make sure that we are making ourselves available to God. So how do you live this all out? How do we worship God by living out the lessons that he's trying to teach us in this book of Haggai? Again, I want to remind you of that quote from uh, Maya Angelou. Beautiful quote. Every storm runs out of rain. These hard times that we're experiencing right now, these difficult times, these will pass. They all pass. Darkness is always followed by dawn. When we return back to our workplaces, when we return back to the marketplace, when we go back to the life we knew before this pandemic, what will our priorities be? You need to focus on your spiritual life. Don't rejoin the rat race. Don't pursue wealth. Don't be greedy. Don't spend every dollar you have, but plan for the future. Plan for the good times and the bad times. Focus on what God calls us to focus on, to alleviate poverty, to pursue justice, and to pursue Jesus. We need to focus on these things because this is what the prophets told the people of Israel and Judah repeatedly. To focus on alleviating poverty and the oppression of the poor. To pursue justice and to pursue God. Not to worship anyone but God. Don't allow yourself to return to the conditions that bred destruction. If you think about this world that we live in, we have conditions that breed destruction. We have people living in poverty. We have people without health care. We have people without adequate nutrition. We have starving children. We have court systems that have different rules for different people. If you are African American, it is more likely you will find yourself with a higher bail or denied bail or put into jail, and that is wrong. That is a corrupt court. The rich get different rules than the poor. That is a corrupt court. And it leads to social problems. And when we turn away from God and the way that God has shown us how to live, and instead we focus upon material things and we go for the pursuit of wealth and we feed the monster of greed, we destroy others. And we don't care about their lives. We care about the almighty dollar. And that is wrong. And that brings about the destruction of the nation. God doesn't pour out hurricanes and diseases upon us. We create them for ourselves by destroying the society living after worldly ways. But when we turn to God and we follow God's ways, and we take care of the poor and the oppressed, when we make sure there is justice and we follow Jesus, the world becomes a better place. I want to share with you one last picture. This is a picture of Skid Row in Los Angeles, just a few miles from where I'm standing right now. And when you look at this picture, it's right outside of the Union Rescue Mission, where people are trying to do good and help to feed those who need a meal. But it is our society, it is our culture, that is producing this problem because even though we proclaim ourselves a Christian nation, we don't live it. Because in a Christian nation, this would never happen. This would never happen. Oh, indeed, there would be those who are less fortunate, but we wouldn't have these kind of conditions that breed the destruction of a nation, that breed disease, and that continues cycles of poverty that are moved on. We need to live out the call of Haggai and reset our priorities and to focus upon God and not material things. That's it for today. And until we meet again, may God bless you. Go in peace.